Good evening and welcome. My name is Nestor Matthews. I'm coming to you from Denison University and you're joining the Blowing Off STEAM series tonight. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this Blowing Off STEAM series. STEAM is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. And I put the emphasis on arts because that's what we're going to be featuring tonight. This series is a collaboration among three institutions and it's the Granville Public Library, the Ohio State University's Newark campus, and Denison University. I'm grateful to my collaborators at the two other institutions, Lucy Chin Parker, who's with us tonight from the Granville Public Library, and Professor Mike Stamatikos from OSU Newark's Astronomy and Physics Department. We are the coordinators of this, and we do this every the second Tuesday of every month, and we'd, we'd like to put in a little plug for next month. On January 11th, we're going to have our next edition of Flowing Off Steam, and I'm delighted that my colleague from Denison in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology, Dr. Hosna Shikol Salami is going to be joining us, and she's going to be talking about publishing Western work in Iran. I think it's going to be a very fascinating topic, so that will be on January 11th, Tuesday, that is, January 11th at 7 p.m., and as always, you'll be able to get the Zoom coordinates for that event through the Granville Public Library, so we look forward to seeing you next time. As for this time, it's my great pleasure to say that we have many different artists joining us tonight. Our featured artist is going to be Denison's artist from residence, Ethel. Um, the members of Ethel are shown here. Uh, this is a picture of them, I believe, at the Met. They are the artist in residence at the balcony bar at the Met. And we're going to show a video in just a moment, but so that you can make a connection between the faces that you see here in this picture and some of the faces that you'll see in the background of the video, I'll ask the members of Ethel just to say a quick hello as we go from left to right, starting with Kip. Hello, everyone. So nice to be with you tonight. Thank you, Nestor. Uh, thank you, Professor Stamatikos. Thank you, uh, Lucy. I don't know your surname, but thank you so much. We love the Granville Public Library. Um, so many faces uh, that we know and love in this uh, gallery of, of Zoom faces here tonight. Um, needless to say, the photographer asked us to look very serious, and we did our best to oblige. Um, I'm the violinist on the left half of the screen. So nice to meet you. <laughs> Kip, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Up next is Ralph. Ralph, can we get a hello from you? Well, hello. Yes, we do look incredibly serious. I, I think I look the most serious, like I'm very concerned that we're taking a photo. At. Um, I assure you, it's not it's not quite like that in this video that you're about to see. So we're looking forward to sharing that with you. I'm the violist, as as you can see, that is uh, my viola under my arm there. And um, there we go. Thrilled to see all these fabulous people and uh, great to meet new people. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. And, and special thanks also to Ralph. All, all of the Ethels, as we affectionately call them, uh, contributed to the organization of this during the last week or so. I've been working very closely with Ralph just on some of the logistics. So, Ralph, thank you for that. It's, it's always, always a pleasure. We're thank up to you. Dorothy. Hi, Sadie. Yes, uh, and I will be your cellist for this journey. Yes. Uh, happy, to, so happy, Nestor. So proud to be with you. Thank you for, for doing this with us. Welcome, Dorothy, as, as always, so good to see you. And last but not least in our picture here, we have Corey, our other violinist. How's it going? I'm Corey, also excited to be here. And I think I look the most, most bored in that picture out of everyone. <laughs> the coolest, the coolest, definitely the coolest. Resting bored face. <laughs> well, in contrast to the, the faces that they were asked to pose with in this diagram, I think you're going to see that we're having a really fun video that's gonna come up. And I'll, I'll let the members of Ethel describe that video and how it came to be. Uh, after we watch the video, we won't watch it in its entirety. This is going to be a Facebook video. And some of our viewers will recognize that the video is going to feature a 1970s pop and rock and roll star, Todd Rundgren. So I wasn't fooling around when I said that the members of Ethel really do get to schmooze with some very, very interesting people, lots of them, including Joe Jackson, I think, was, uh, was on this tour with them not too long ago. So um, I'm going to roll the video. And as the video is starting, it's going to start with Ralph. And just as a heads up, it's going to be in black and white. And the first five or 10 seconds or so, you will hear Ralph speaking backwards, and then it will straighten out after that. So it's not a video glitch. That's actually the way that this starts. If you're getting the video, when I hit the go button, can you give me a thumbs up so I know that you all can hear it? We did a sound check earlier. I just want to make sure that it's going to work with the audience. Okay, so here we are. 
Okay, and this is Ethel playing with Todd Rundgren. And here's Ralph speaking backwards. Thumbs up if you can hear this. Fun. All right. Well, thank you, members of Ethel, for that. I, I wonder if um, the members of Ethel would like to share with us maybe how that came to, to be, or and or I, I know that we've had Ethel as our artist in residence since 2013. I've had the good pleasure of working with them for eight years. And we were together every year, except, uh, of course, the, the COVID year. They weren't on, on campus for practical reasons. Um, so a lot has happened over that year, and it's delightful to have them back on campus this, this semester. So I'd like to um, maybe open the floor up to Ethel and invite them to talk about the return to the stage, the return to Denison, or how that video came, up, came into being. I, I would like to start by just drawing the attention to the genius, the insane, like evil genius of Kip Jones, because <laughs> yes, the plant, the plant in the in the diary is it's 
it was un, unforetold. It was it was absolutely an unquantifiable <laughs> plant uh, issue. How would anybody respond to the technical, you know, economical, practical lockdowns and and disruptions of of these last two years? You know, and as artists, uh, to continue to process and deliver and be present and draw, you know, give people relief under these circumstances was an, it was a challenge. It was a delightful challenge in a lot of ways, but that fabulous document is uniquely of the, the brain and inspiration. Kip, please tell us about this because it was a, a complete vision. Dorothy, thank you. You are very kind. Um, the short version of the long story is that we've been working as the ensemble in residence, uh, not just at Denison University, but also at the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Balcony Bar for, for quite some time. And at the beginning of the pandemic, they closed their doors to the public. And we uh, had a conversation with them about how we might take our residency virtual. And um, I was at the time laboring under the apprehension that we had to work uh, harder than ever to to do whatever it was that we had to do, and um, I'm glad that thankfully our our contact at the museum over time, you know, a, a few months in said, you know, really we don't have to reinvent the wheel every every single week. To which I am I'm very grateful to Lamore for that that sort of mercy. Uh, but at the moment that video was done, I felt as though it was our responsibility to. Um, uh, I don't know, to make some brand new piece of art that nobody had ever seen on a, on a weekly basis. And so that was my all in that video that we saw. And uh, Todd is a very weird guy. Any of you who have listened to much of his music um, might gather. Um, he's, he's a big ideas guy. Uh, he's, um, well, we don't have to go there. So if I say he, so we, we talked about some different ideas and I've been watching a lot of David Lynch and uh, you know, some Dadaist, uh, you know, 1920s works. And I was just really in this sort of surrealist mode. And, and so I requested that each member of Ethel send me some takes of them doing strange walks, uh, you know, a la John Cleese. And so each person sent their, sent their strange walks and added, added, you know, various types of, of personal flair and spice. And Todd sent in some green screen video with uh, footage of his, you know, um, adopted, you know, state of Hawaii behind him. And, um, and then I, I don't know how many hours I spent cutting that thing, but it was just an absurd amount of time. And uh, my, my goal was to express what it felt like to be three months into the pandemic and to be an artist and to have taken this, you know, vow of silence and, and figuring out how to, how to be and how to be together in that moment in time. And so that video uh, came out of that. My favorite moment watching it this, this last time is uh, Ralph with the garlic on the, on the roof where he's really just, He's really in, and uh, he does that wonderful backwards walk across his roof with the garlic. Um, I mean, but there, I could, I could say 10 or 12 things that just as I was cutting that video just cracked me up. Um, every time Ralph got ready to sing a vocal part, he, he kind of prepared himself and brought a lot of breath in and brought a lot of seriousness into his face before he delivered it. And then so that meant that when I flipped it backwards, he would deliver his vocal and then afterward he would get extraordinarily relaxed. You know, and so the end of those vocal takes are actually Ralph preparing to sing, but instead the effect for me is is one of like he's delivered his role and now he's now he's just free to be himself. And, um, you know, I got three different ones right because there are three different moments the background vocal comes in and um, and uh, the the sound he says when he's saying backwards we're going yes, 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 is a slate. And uh, he was having difficulty getting the, uh, you know, the visual and the auditory tracks to sync up for what he felt I needed. And so he was slating it multiple times and sort of in frustration as well at the beginning. Slate, 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 you know, so I'd really have a clear, you know, uh, and so there, I mean, there's about 90 inside jokes in there and, and you saw them all and, and so on and so forth. But that was, a, that was a, a bright point for me in our, you know, very dark first months of the pandemic. And, uh, and there it is, a document for all time, all humanity. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> um, I do want to move on to the next item in just a moment, but there's one other tidbit. As Ralph and I were, were chatting about putting this together, I was so excited to hear that Ethel had this video with Todd Rundgren, 
when I was growing up a kid in the 1970s, I had older brothers that were really into classic rock and really into pop music and, and they played guitar and they were huge Todd Rundgren fans. And so to hear that these folks that I'd, I've known over these eight years were now doing a video with Todd was, was great for me. And Ralph also mentioned one other thing musically that I, I picked up on after he said so, but not before he had said so. And that is that many of Todd's musical phrases are coming in early. Musicians talk about playing ahead of the beat or playing even way ahead of the beat. And sometimes soloists will do that to create some tension. They'll start maybe um, articulating their chord changes before the ensemble has caught up with them. And I thought I detected that a few times, uh, very, very tactfully done. And then we get to the chorus and the ensembles with him. Uh, and just really neat, really neat to see that. And I, I thank Ralph for pointing that out. Nestor, if I could to that, that, that moment at that his treatment throughout the whole thing is absolutely amazing the faith that todd clearly demonstrates and the time behind him we've known him for 17 years or something now um 15 years maybe and we're we're good friends and and he trusts us we trust him he trusted his song to kip's amazing care and he trusted the time to us to just be there for him and he could play ahead, behind, however he liked, and it just allowed for a really easeful presentation in this really goofy and hilarious video. <laughs> it's so, so wonderful. So um, we started out with the members of Ethel interacting with somebody who you know, was around in the 1970s, clearly a seasoned professional, just a long-standing professional. The great thing about Ethel is not only do they work with folks like that, they work with our newest composers, and this allows me to transition to our, our first student. So um, Denison has a, a longstanding tradition of having these composer, student composer concerts, and here we are in the month of December, and I was uh, thrilled to be at Denison's Eisner Center just a week or two ago and listening to Ethel perform pieces that have been composed by Denison students, and we're very lucky tonight to have with us Katie Amrine who is a sophomore in English, creative writing and communication double major here at Denison. She's also a music composition minor and she's from the town of Delaware, Ohio. And we'll ask Katie in a moment to um, uh, unmute herself. But I think what we'll do first, if it's all right, is we do have a clip uh, of, of Ethel performing Katie's piece. Uh, and I'd like to play that piece, and you'll see that uh, Ethel's on stage, and just for a little bit of context, I was in the audience when this, this was being recorded, and somewhere not too far away from me was Katie, so she's in the audience watching the members of Ethel play her piece, uh, which, which must have been really, uh, really quite good. So I'm going to call that up again, if you'll give me just a second to share the screen. Okay, this fine afternoon, the composition is by Katie Amrine, and this is being performed by Ethel. Again, if you could give me thumbs up when you hear the sound coming on. Here we go. Sound is not coming through. Sound is coming through. It, yes, at the beginning it wasn't, but you brought it up. Okay, here we go. Maybe you could restart? Yep. Okay, so it's quiet in the very beginning.
I'll stop the share so we can see each other during the conversation. First, congratulations to Katie on a, a wonderful composition. Yeah, I see some people are offering their Zoom applause, so that, that's wonderful. Uh, great to see. And we'll ask Katie to unmute herself. I'll offer one other congratulations to Katie and to our other two students and maybe other students who are joining us. Today is also the last day of classes at Denison for the semester. So not only, so th this I hope is a fun way for our students to end the semester, right? They've been going at it since late August. And just a couple of hours ago, class is finished. Tomorrow they get a reading day and then final exams start the day after that. But tonight we get to enjoy the music, including Katie's music. So Katie, congratulations. Uh, Katie and I had the opportunity to talk the other day, and Katie, I wonder if you might share with us, just to begin, because not all of us are music composers, just sort of mechanically, um, can you share with us how you wrote that music? Did you write it with pencil, pencil and paper, or were you using some kind of software or combination? Yeah, so thank you for your congratulations, um, but I use the uh, software Sibelius, uh, I used to use MuseScore back in the day, but now I use Sibelius, um, which basically just lets you input the notes like on the staff where you want them and stuff like that. Um, sometimes I use like paper and pencil, but that's mostly like when I'm just out, like out and about like walking places and I just get like an idea that I have for my piece and I'm like, oh, I have to write that down. I'll like write it down. And like my iPad's got some like staff paper in it or I'll grab a notebook with some staff paper and jot stuff down. Um, but yeah, I mainly use Sibelius for my comp compositions. Great, great. So uh, that was news to me. I, I, I think I had heard about Sibelius, but um, it's nice to know that our student composers are working with that. Um, so a couple of other things, I wonder if you might share with us. Um, so that was mechanically how you sort of pull those together. So how, how did you actually get the musical idea and and how does that develop over time? I would imagine something like that takes a, a while to develop. So can you share with us some insights about that? Yeah, um, so actually I was really inspired by, I don't know if anybody's like familiar with Studio Ghibli, but they're like a, an animation studio and a lot of their movies have some really cool like soundtracks uh, in them. And so that's sort of like the, the tone I was going for. I also have a habit of writing these like really dramatic like uh, pieces and I wanted something a little bit more like fun and like just light something you can listen to like I don't know you're out for a walk it's a sunny day uh, so then I like formed this like one eight bar melody and then as it like developed I, it's a lot of like copying and pasting and then like moving the notes around to see like if different intervals work if like the direction of the music needs to go a different way um, but yeah, I was really inspired by like Studio Ghibli music and like the tone that I was going for. Excellent, excellent. I might now invite the, um, either Katie or the members of Ethel to talk about how that all came together. So we've got Katie starting out in Sibelius, she's using some software, she's piecing these uh, ideas together, and then at some point, uh, the rubber's going to meet the road and we're coming up on performance night, right? So it's the month of December and uh, in roles are artists of residence and here, here comes Ethel. And so I wonder if either the Ethel members or Katie might talk a little bit about how that came together. I think I'd love to hear from Katie actually how it ex how the experience from, from your side, Katie, how that came across because I, I can totally describe what our process is, how that comes to us. But I'd love to hear, you know, as you know, because we'd never met each other before. Yeah, so I like wrote it and then it was like a week. It was the week before Thanksgiving break where I like finished it and I turned it into uh, Dr. Lee, my professor. Um, and then, but up until that point, all I've ever heard it in was like MIDI sounds. Sibelius has like a feature where you can like play it back. So it'll play it in like weird like robotic sounds and you can like change the settings but really doesn't help that much it's still like nothing compared to like live playing so the first time that I heard it played like live uh by Ethel was the night before the performance um so I <laughs> heard it but thankfully it turned out so great they did such a great job and I was like I heard it live and I was like wow this is gonna be wonderful um so yeah did, did you feel, I mean, one of the things we like to make clear when we're in that moment of, you know, delivering a sound for a composer, we, we urgently want a composer to tell us whether the sound we're producing has any relationship to what they were hoping for, you know, so, I mean, 
I hope we made that clear. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. It, you, it was just so beautiful. I was like, no notes, no notes. It's wonderful. Uh, thank you. Well, you know, we recognized it. We totally understood the the uh, the sort of the reference sound that you you were just talking about, Studio Ghibli, and the music of Joe Hisaishi, and um, uh, it's um, uh, it's a it's an astonishingly beautiful kind of music. We 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 fell quickly into that spirit, you know, and, and it, it's always nice. That's one of the reasons for. Of, of learning a body of of uh, the history of an art form, you know, is to have those common references that you can actually quickly quickly share. Um, and we felt that you did a terrific job of of you know just nailing that color. It wasn't hard for us to understand our role in that at all. It was very very nice. Uh, I was going to say that um, in working with the students at Denison. Uh, the the uh, the training and the support from the faculty is so so substantial, so so caring and and uh, you know manifest that in fact um, a lot of the work of mm, sort of massaging the the transitions and making sure that the performers get the information they need has been very well taken care of. So we're you know we're given materials that we can act, trans, translate into sound very, very quickly. Um, we've, we've had experience in different situations of delivering a sound that we, we were giving a guess. We were sort of saying, oh, this, this reminds us of something we, we know from this style and we'd start playing. We've had situations where the composers we were playing for would say, no, no, not like that. In fact, the I think the place where I heard that the the most uh, emphatically was when we were performing music for Native American students on the Navajo Nation, where uh, we were trying to find colors from you know the Western Western traditions, the Western cultural traditions to adopt in their music, and they were saying no 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 that's not what we're aiming for that's no it, you know, we were we were trying to make it. More, more colorful, maybe more exciting, more, you know, brighter, faster, or something. And they were saying, "No, patient, quiet, reverent." You know, they were saying, "Oh, okay, let's learn." And and this is actually one of the most beautiful things about sharing an art form, sharing a language like that, is learning about that difference, the cultural uh, uh, information embedded in the sound, and and. Uh, delivering it, well, participating in it, letting your nervous system connect with it. it. We really do. Through music, we really connect our nervous systems. Excellent. Well, I, I'm, a, I'm a neuroscientist also, so I love hearing uh, about that conceptualization of music. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Before we move on to our next student, I wonder if I might ask one more question of Katie. Just You kind of alluded to it, but uh, so that evening, the evening before, is before the performance is when Ethel is beginning to play this and you're hearing that, then there's the night of the performance and it's one student after the next. And now it's your turn, Katie, that your piece is about to be performed and you're sitting in the audience right? and, and you know that your piece is next. And then all of a sudden, you know, you hear it and you're hearing it at the same time that the audience is hearing it, except you're the one member of the audience that actually wrote this. What was that like? Well, it's just like, it, it feels like it shouldn't be nerve wracking because like, all the work, my work is done. It's it's all about the performers at that point. Like, I don't have anything left to do, but yeah, I'm just like, I'm so nervous because I've heard this piece like so many times, either like live or like through Sibelius. Uh, but like, then I'm sitting next to like my family, my friends, and they're like, they're like, it's almost your time. It's almost your time. They've like barely heard it before. Um, it's, it's very exciting. Um, but I'm like also a performer, I'm a violinist. Um, and so I'm used to like being on the stage as well uh, and like performing. So it's so weird to get that nerve, like those nerves sitting in the audience. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really cool though to like hear something that I wrote performed by like professional musicians on a stage in front of people. It was so fun. <laughs> Wonderful. Katie, thank you so much. Uh, that was a lovely piece, and we really appreciate 
your thoughts tonight, that that helps us. It helps us to understand the many ways that we connect with Ethel, our artists and residents. So we're gonna move on to the second of three students now, and we're going to see a very different kind of interaction. And, and this was, as we had seen just a moment ago, Katie was part of our student composers. Now I see that we have some faculty uh, and, and staff who are involved in that. I see Mike is with us and Marla is with us and uh, Dr. Ching Shu Hu from the music department is with us. And he spent so much time over the years connecting our students in this way. Now we have a no relatively novel connection between Ethel and students at Denison. And this is through Denison's Red Frame Lab. So with this, it's my great pleasure to introduce our second of three students. This is Sydney Kissler, who is a senior here at Denison. She comes to us from San Francisco and she's majoring in global commerce. And also she has a bluegrass minor here at Denison. And she's been very, very involved with the Red Frame Lab. And uh, I had the chance to talk with Sydney a little bit the, the other day. And I also saw her on stage about two weeks ago at the Bluegrass concert. And she was, she was wonderful. Tonight, she's gonna be talking with us about some of her work with the Red Frame Lab. It's Denison's new endeavor into entrepreneurship and how they've connected with uh, with Ethel. So why don't we turn the mic over to Sydney to talk about her project. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, hi, I'm Sydney. I am a senior, as uh, Professor Matthew said. Um, I'm starting Denison's record label, which I'm excited to talk to you about this evening. Um, I'm su super thrilled to be here, especially because I had the chance to speak with Ethel and receive a lot of incredible advice um, in which how I'll reshape the record label into what I've already sort of worked out this semester. And I'm excited to have Ralph on the board and perhaps some others as well. Um, so very exciting stuff, only at Denison would I get that opportunity. Um, so to start out, I've been working with both the uh, music department as well as the Red Frame Lab to shape this record label. Um, I've been receiving mentorship from my professor, Adam Schlenker, who heads the Bluegrass department. Um, as well as one of my favorite artists, Aoife O'Donovan, who happened to be a Vail series artist at Denison, um, Addison Egan, a friend of mine um, who was a runner up on The Voice, and uh, both ensembles and residents, uh, Third Coast Percussion and of course Ethel, um, to advise me on the best artist experience in regards to record labels and what a Denison student would most uh, want when coming to school here. In regards to the financial and legal model, I've been receiving coaching from the Red Frame Lab, which is our entrepreneurship center on campus, as well as working with Alexandra Schimmer, who is Denison's attorney, and President Weinberg. Um, and our goal has mostly been focused on creating a space where Denison's work, artistic works are being showcased to its capacity and overall increasing Denison's artistic reputation. We aspire to do this through two components in regards to the production of the arts. We have a great sound engineer, Tom Atha, who has worked with one of my favorite bands, um, 21 Pilots. I don't know if any of you listen to them. Um, and um, as well as the marketing and business component. Um, and I've been speaking with various faculty in the communications department, as well as the econ department um, to structure that as well. Um, and I've also spoken with a bunch of alumni who have graduated as art students and received feedback from them, them about what they wish that their art education had had more of, a lot of which is in, um, in regards to the component of packaging themselves as an artist better. Um, and as a liberal arts school with uh, emphasis on interdisciplinary education, um, I think that that would be a really important component to this record label. Um, I also have spoken with various artists at, at different universities with record labels, uh, as well as faculty at different record labels at different universities um, to think about how they've structured their record labels and how Denison should apply that or um, differ from various universities. Um, I was particularly impressed by Syracuse uh, business model um, and have had a great ongoing conversations with them. Um, and I'm very excited to um, bring a pre-recorded component of this record label um, where students can bring in their um, pre-recorded songs that they've already um, done in the times of COVID, et cetera, when um, artists have had that 
uh, chance, as you've seen with um, artists like Ethel, um, and um, also provide an opportunity for students to record their original works. Um, and lastly, I'm excited to, once the uh, financial documents and legal documents are um, finalized uh, between the university and record label, as well as the artist and the label, I'm excited to uh, be releasing three singles um, of various different um, genres. Um, as of right now, we are looking at uh, having a, a rap genre um, with one of my good friends who is an alumni, which is exciting to bring in that alumni connection. Um, and a, a classical component as well. Um, and lastly, a, a folk pop uh, genre as well as uh, one of my singles will also be one of the three. Um, and in regards to that, um, I'm excited to be able to present those singles on uh, Denison's Doobie radio station and get some airplay time as well. So that's ex uh, where we are right now. Um, and I'm really appreciative of all of the advice I've received from Ethel um, and just to be here this evening to share it with you. Sydney, that's fantastic. Uh, really exciting to see uh, the arts thriving, but also this connection between the arts and the entrepreneurial spirit in the Red Frame Lab and how you're connecting with Ethel. I, I invite any members of Ethel that have been connected. I think maybe Ralph has been connected with this, but I, I'm not sure if Ralph is um, connecting with you through the, the Red Frame Lab. Yes, I was. Um, it, we were thrilled to see when we got to campus, uh, our first time back for a year and a half, that on our docket was a meeting with this student who was founding Roll Denny Records, right? Is That's that, right. That Roll Denny Records. I love it. Roll Denny Records. Um, and uh, Corey and Kip and I were were fortunate enough to sit with Sydney at that point, and and just basically. She pitched us. She showed us what she was up to. She told us the plan. We looked at all sorts of um, marketing considerations and technical considerations and what's this school doing and what's this entrepreneur doing. And we were just so deeply impressed with her spirit and actually her her sense of drive to support community. That was the thing that really hit us so particularly hard because when we first came to Denison, it was in fact community that resonated with us good friends that are on this this space right now, Mike and Marla and Chewy and Jim and Nestor, you all know it. Hey, Kyung, you all know it. It's community. That's that's where we thrive. That's where that connection, the intersection between Ethel and Denison lives. That's That just resonates for us. And that's what Sydney is putting forward, community first. Um, and and we were so touched and moved by that. And that's why I said immediately that meeting, Sydney, I want to be on your board. And, and I guess I am. Look at that. Thank you. Hey, oh, my gosh. The next meeting. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was so honored to, to get the chance to speak with you all. And your advice was incredible. Um, so really, it, the honor is all mine. Well, I also want to say there was there was a fascinating moment. I mean, Ethel Ethel has great fun sort of overlapping our skill sets. Um, and we're doing a lot of, okay, this is your focus for this week. You're going to take care of that, and I'm going to take care of that. It was really fun to be in that space with Kip and Corey and you. Um, Kip had all of, I think, 12 minutes to be with us, and he just hit super hard and super precisely on a whole bunch of amazing topics and then he had to fly and then Corey went deep into like business stuff harvard business schools to cory what was, some, what was some, of the, some of the stuff you were um addressing with sydney well the good thing about a long-term collaboration between denison and ethel is you get to be really honest with every single person <laughs> you know and it's it's not in the name of like let's be hard on the person but it's, it's like in the name of love and support and because sydney knew her stuff so well i I thought it would be, well, what else am I going to add besides just try to grill her? So I tried to grill her, but it didn't work. So she's kicking butt. No. Oh, my gosh. I, I love honest advice is the only kind of advice I ever want. So you gave me a lot to think about, which was great. I, I have to I have to underscore what Corey's just saying. Sydney, you're demonstrating something um, just wisdom beyond your years, just the ability to to be vulnerable in a space as you're making a pitch, you're sharing this, this, 
this beautiful project of yours and saying, hey, this is what I'd like to do, and you're welcoming all the feedback and you're um, you're listening to it, it's going in, it's actually getting recorded, and you know some of it may work, some of it may not, but it's just what you're doing. It's just the, the process of learning and growing, and it's so awesome to be around that. And it's actually really inspiring to us, and you're just symbolizing exactly the spirit and of, of, of love and joy and collaboration and again community that we love so much at Denison. So roll Denny Records all the way. <laughs> You're so kind. That means so much coming from you all. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you, Sydney. And picking up on the community spirit here, we'll begin to transition into our, our third student. I just want to, again, remind the audience of the breadth of connections that we have with Ethel, our artists and residents here. So we've heard from a student composer, and then you can see almost the business angle kicking in with the Red Frame Lab and Sydney's uh, up and coming record label. Um, the, the artists and residents connect with us. They come to my classroom, my science classroom. They, they connect with people in the theater. And to introduce our third student, we're very excited uh, to have our third student with us tonight. But I'd, I'd like my colleague in the Department of Theater, Jim Denning, who is with us tonight, um, maybe to say a few words about the context for the work that our, um, our, our upcoming student did with Ethel. So, Jim, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Nestor. Um, I was not prepared to talk about the context, but I will for a minute. Uh, we did a, uh, last year during the pandemic when theater is challenged like all the performing arts, we, we put together a virtual performance for, um, for students of color to have a platform to celebrate what we took from um, a Harlem Renaissance playwright as uh, youth joy love and vitality to celebrate that on campus and it was a series of mostly solo performances um there were some there were some group pieces there was a a dance piece that was performed over somebody's a rap and there was um there was a singing group called tahila and the rest were solo performances and films that were made and uh, we worked with ethel very closely um, to compose original music for almost all of the pieces, though not all of them. There were poet, there was poetry, stories, spoken word, and um, each of the four Ethels worked with a different um, couple of performers to make original music that went with their piece. And I believe that you're going to see one of those now. And yes. so, what I'm prepared to do is to introduce the superstar Yasmin Simpson. So. Um, she goes by Yaz. She's a poet and a writer. She's a junior at Denison, double majoring in psychology and cinema. Uh, at Denison, she is a community advisor. She's a member of the Black Student Union and the Denison Film Society. She plays intramural volleyball, where she is also a first responder, first responder for intramural sports at large at Denison. Uh, she's been selected as a mentee by the Future Now Media Foundation. And in case that's not quite enough, she has a black belt in karate and teaches karate classes when she's home in Chicago. And she loves musicals. So it's my pleasure to introduce Yaz Simpson. Yaz, we'll, we'll hear from Yaz in just a moment. I'm going to take a moment to call up the video. And uh, as always, I wanna make sure that you're hearing the sound. You'll hear um, Yaz speaking in just a moment. I'm gonna turn up the volume just a little bit. And when you hear the speaking coming on and you're able to hear Yaz's voice. I hope you'll give me a thumbs up so I know that we'll do this. It might take a, a try or two, but I'm sure we'll get there. Excuse me, that's not it. Okay, here we go. My name is Yasmin Simpson and I will be performing a poem I wrote titled Most Beautiful. I remember crying in the mirror after my mother finished my hair. I locked myself in the bathroom and stared at my reflection. Two large puffs stand on my head seeking attention. How could I look like this? I remove one puff and hair stands up stubbornly as if trying to make a statement. I press my hand on my head, trying to straighten the thickness with my palm, but it goes up instead of down. It's puffy, it's loose, it won't go down. 
broken, I give up the fight. Tears streaming down on my premature face. I take my hair tie. Sorry that this is cutting out. We'll stay with it for just a moment. Oh, what a shame. And fix it. My mother notices my red eyes and asks, Okay, this might be a, a asks why I cried. I tell her I don't like my hair. I beg her to fix it. Something else, anything else, I beg. I just want to look like my friends. She tells me it's beautiful, that this is the hair that I was born with, that this is what I look like. But I didn't understand it then. My parents would smother me with beautiful words. My father calling me MB. MB for most beautiful. But you see, I didn't understand it then. When I went to school, no one called me beautiful. The girls would talk about their long wavy hair and I would sit back in awe. When I went to school, the boys said they only dated the beautiful girls. The girls who only took five minutes to detangle their hair. The girls whose hair went down, not up. The boys would call them beautiful. And when I went home, my father would say to me, come here, MB. But at the time, I just wanted someone who wasn't my father to call me most beautiful. When I was in high school, I hid what others considered ugly. My mother hired a hairstylist who circled the ugly, creating beauty. My hair finally went down, and I concealed it in protective hairstyles, rocking the beautiful twists. But after two months, the ugly would return. When I was in high school, the boys started noticing me. They would call me nice names like pretty, hot, exotic. I was so happy. Shoulders pressed back, head held high. I would smile, showing all of my teeth. But then they would finish their thought, adding, for a black girl. When I was in high school, I knew I wasn't white, but I didn't want to be black. I didn't want to be the first black girl you've been with. I didn't want to be the dark chocolate to your white chips. I wanted to be beautiful. When I came to Denison, I was not ready. Though a predominantly white institution, Denison's black community has beauty. They were both black and beautiful. And with their warm embraces, they've helped me and I've learned. All my life I've known of white beauty. People say white beauty is the right beauty, but what about black beauty? What about the box braids, the design so precise they come in every shape? What about the big afro? This right here is the view. So what if it takes hours to detangle? Beauty takes time. So what if it doesn't bounce off my back? It defies gravity. So what if it doesn't blend in? It was born to stand out. Do you see this hair? I'm sorry. Do you see this beautiful hair? I did this. I may not be beautifully white, but I am beautifully black. And daddy, you're right. I am most beautiful. Wow. <clears throat> Outstanding. Outstanding. Thank you all for bearing with that technical glitch, um, but we, we persevered. Just absolutely wonderful, uh, beautifully delivered, very well written, and uh, also thanks to Kip, who I understand was writing the music there. Why don't we go with, with Yaz just to say a few words about uh, how you began thinking of that piece and also how you connected with, with Ethel. Yeah, so hi guys, I'm Yaz. Um, Kip, hello again. 
it's been a while. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I basically got the idea to talk about my hair because when I came to Denison, um, thank you. When I came to, I just got your message. Thank you. Um, when I came to Denison, a big part of my uh, struggle was trying to find, trying to figure out which hairstyle I would wear. Uh, and a lot of people don't really think about that because they don't really have to go through that struggle. Um, when I came here, I came in twists. They were different from these. They were short and they lasted about two months. But as soon as I had to be natural, I was like, what do I do? And thanks to um, organizations like the BSU or La Fuerza, the multicultural organizations, uh, a lot of my friends who are in it helped me. And I figured out how to finally work my natural hair. And um, I figured that it's not ugly. It's not what I always thought it was or what people always told me it was. It's not this, um, I don't know, ugly thing. It's actually beautiful. And um, I wanted to write about that. And uh, me and Jim, Jim, we met a really long time. Actually, not that long ago, Jim. Like a year ago, a year and a half ago. And um, yeah, and Jim came to me with this great idea. He was like, I want to have a production with the students of color. And I was like, let's do it. I would love that. And uh, we kind of went through it with that. Um, and then we met Ethel through finding all of the people and hear us. And then we, we decided that a lot of the performances were spoken word. Um, and we thought that having music original songs in the background would be really beautiful and it worked out and the, per the person who I worked with was Kip. So. Excellent. It was, it was super fun. Yeah. Was, uh, what a great piece. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I wasn't prepared. I didn't know what to expect. We never know what to expect. Uh, but uh, I think like everybody else in this, uh, in this room, like I was just bowled over instantly by the honesty of it. And it's kind of like, it sort of it sort of makes the musical challenge I think uh, more. Um, uh, I think it makes it harder, honestly, because because you want to you know I want to serve your piece, but I also feel like I have to meet the honesty level in some way. And so it was a good again, it was a good challenge to have, especially at that moment in the pandemic when you know we've been thinking about different things, different ways, and all of a sudden you know here's a chance to actually collaborate. I was also really impressed with the editor. What was uh, what was what was her name? Florence Barrow Adams. Yeah. He's man. a teacher at NYU. Okay. I, I wanted you... to just add briefly, you might have gathered it, but um, Yaz was one of the co-founders of Hear Us. So she not only created that piece, but she also helped to create the whole platform, which we're doing again this year and, and, and working live. And there's more people. So we're really excited this year. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay, um, what I'd like to do now, I'm just looking at the clock and we do have a few minutes. I wanna respect everybody's time because we, we typically wrap up at eight o'clock. We have about five minutes. And this is an opportunity um, to just open up the floor for anybody to, to chat with anybody else. So we'll, we'll keep it orderly, but uh, we've had three very different kinds of student presentations and we've seen how, how Ethel has connected with these different Denison students. And uh, the, the floor is open. I see that we have many community members. Um, uh, uh, and, and some alum, uh, emeritus faculty with us. So anybody who has a question or a comment, that includes the students, please feel free to unmute and, and share. I'm thinking about the whirlwind that Ethel must be in uh, when they come to, to campus. So probably just about every minute is scheduled, right? And, and we, we have lots of people to thank for that. But uh, they, they, they come in and sometimes they're in the classroom, sometimes they're down the hill at the Eisner Center and they're performing. Uh, other times they're, they're up the hill and they're working. I think they've been in the organizational psychology class talking about the entrepreneurial end of their art, right? Uh, so they, they get connected in lots of ways. It's just a, a probably nonstop activities once they, they land here at Denison. I'll we, say something. Yeah. Oh, no, go, go for it. No, go for it, Jim. Go for it. I was just going to sing some more Ethel praise, but there's so much of it. Dorothy, you go. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I actually wanted to turn the, the, the conversation over to the students again to just ask, um, you know, uh, uh, Yaz, I'm wondering if you're using the materials from the the ver the iteration of the program that you part you did already, which is so effective, to to kind of attract more interest. To you said there are going to be even more students involved. Um, I think that's even in a campus, and this is one of the things that we have found as artists in residence. We've been in this extraordinary relationship, I mean, really out of the ordinary relationship with the college for now eight years. And uh, the relationships deepen and the geometry increases over time and the opportunities evolve. You know, there, there are opportunities we have now with, with the community, with the, with the faculty, with the students that we didn't have when we first walked in and we started offering our, our services, offering, you know, trying, trying to figure out what we were good for. Um, and yes, I would wonder if you're using the materials of a successful, a successful project, a successful iteration to create a geometry, you know, invite more, find other people who could benefit. And, and I, I love that that's, that's emerging. I'd love you to talk about that a little bit. Most definitely. Um, last year, we basically started from scratch. Uh, it was me, Jim, and two other facilitators, and we kind of just hopped on Zoom and tried to figure it out. And somehow we got, I think, 34 other artists, and there were 15 performances in total last year, which was a big deal for us. Um, this year, we have even more. And uh, how we did that, yeah, we, we basically, <laughs> we, we presented the previous Hear Us piece, the production, uh, and we kind of ran with it. I did, at least. I, I, <laughs> um, I think that's kind of how we got most of the people. Um, and then a lot of the people as well, like I'm in the Black Student Union, I'm in a lot of the multicultural organizations and a lot of my friends are as well, considering that this is a production by and for people, of students of color, color artists of color. Um, I, I go to the meetings anyway, I tell them about it and I don't really shut up about it. I just, I, I, I tell them, this is what we do, this is who we are, please come to the meeting and they come. That's great to hear. That is really great to hear. Uh, and, you know, the, the qualities of relationship, you know, your usefulness to them, their interest in the general process and their usefulness to their friends is going to just going to keep amplifying. Um, Sydney, I'd love to hear sort of a similar perspective from you, you know, now that you're starting the recordings label and and that, you know, it, it you were describing three projects that you're going to launch with, but, you know, very, very quickly that will play out into as soon as people see it and they go, oh, like that, you know, there will be a, a cascade of applications, you know. Could you talk about that for a second? Definitely. I think that's what I'm most excited about in the launch is um, to see the, I guess, uh, diversity of genres um, that will come to life. Um, I have a lot of uh, different friends who write different types of music. Um, and I think that's the, the cool part about Denison is that it draws a bunch of different um, types of musicians and songwriters, um, spoken word artists, et cetera. Um, and so I'm excited to, to uh, I guess, expand it beyond just the three uh, different genres that I'll be starting out with. Um, and, and what's neat is that there's already a collaboration between uh, the recording class, uh, sound editing and recording taught by Professor Tom Atha um, and the Bluegrass Seminar as well as Computer um, Music Seminar. Um, and those two are already set in stone um, as a part of uh, Denison's coursework. And I've also worked on an application process to allow for students who aren't necessarily music majors or taking a course to get involved because I think that that's part of what makes Denison so unique is that, um, you know, as a global commerce major and a bluegrass music minor, 
at any other school, people would look at me, you know, sideways, like, how are you making that work? But here, it's really not questioned that often. Um, and there are a bunch of different artists from different uh, areas or disciplines of study um, that I'm excited to get involved. So for sure, I'm, you know, more than open uh, to that and excited to see what, what comes. And may I here in front of this gathering make the suggestion that you begin a here now segment of your label that just goes on and on. It's elements of these projects that get recorded and, and uh, you know, you know, archived in in your in your work, as well as potentially, a, a, and Ethel would be willing to participate in this, a, 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 an archive of student comp compositions, like generation by generation, the, the classes who come through and make it to concert presentation. Definitely, that would be uh, the ultimate goal. So I, I really appreciate that. And I'm excited to talk more. Thank you. If I may follow up with you, Dorothy, you just you just opened a question for me, um, Katie. As as an artist who writes music, um, just what are things that pop into your head when you hear that there's a Denison record label showing up? What does that What does that do to you? What does that make you think? Are you suddenly scheming? What's going on? I'd love to hear what you think. Maybe maybe a little, maybe just a little scheming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that that is like definitely that's just so cool um I've written like I wrote a piece uh last semester as well like another trio uh that I wanted to get recorded but it never ended up happening and then this one if since I play the violin if I wanted to play it get grab some other friends like get it recorded and like produced that could be so cool like I was I was listening to to Sydney you talk about everything and I was like oh my gosh what if what if I slid in there <laughs> got some <laughs> stuff recorded that could be so cool could be very exciting to see well i know there's gonna be a whole bunch of student student activity and student works showing up there and i'd love to see here us as well um <laughs> represented i mean spoken word on your label goodness what what a treat that would be sydney you've got you've got a wealth of talent to choose from on this amazing campus um and I guess artists and residents who are ready to record anything for you. So <laughs> I really appreciate that. No, it's true. Um, as it's getting closer to launch, um, the decisions of, you know, who's going to uh, be the first few launches um, or first few uh, releases is definitely difficult um, because there's so much good work, but it only means that it will continue on. So um, thank you very much. The, the synergies that we're starting to see already among these three students are just, just terrific, and they, they remind me of something that our provost here at Denison speaks of all the time. Provost Kim Copeland reminds us that an important document from our, for us at Denison is an essay called Only Connect, and these students are beginning to connect with other students, they're connecting with each other, and they're connecting through Ethel, uh, all through the arts, and we're so grateful to Ethel for spending time with us tonight. We're so grateful to our three students and their mentors who are here tonight. So thank you all for that. We're looking forward to inviting you all back and having you all back um, really any of our Tuesdays. Again, it's the second Tuesday of every month and it'll be January 11th is our next episode. And we're looking forward to having our colleague from anthropology and sociology on January 11th. So let's close this out tonight with one more round of applause for all of our participants. Thank you all. Have a good night.